Well, great, uh, Carolyn, thank you. Uh, this is always a little awkward because I'm just sitting in my office and uh, talking to a screen and Carolyn tells me there are a bunch of people out there somewhere uh, listening to this talk. My name is Bill Schneider and I own and operate Wild Type. We're based in Mason, Michigan, and we are a native plant producer and we do ecologically focused contracting. I know there are uh, many friends out there that know who we are, but if you don't, I encourage you to look us up uh, at our website at uh, wildtypeplants.com, and I hope you can make it out to the nursery sometime this spring. Okay. So the title of this talk is Planting for Shade, and the, the genesis of this talk really started with several conversations I had with Betty Siegel, and many or most of you know Betty, and uh, she has, uh, she's an extraordinary native plant person, and she is always working on her, her yard and problem areas, and we have talked extensively about shade issues, and she encouraged me, invited me to present to this chapter, and I, uh, I agreed. So here we go. So at the nursery, I get a lot of questions about shade. It might be one of the top questions. Where are your shade plants? Which ones are best? Can you make a list? It goes on and on and on. And people use terms like full shade, part shade, part sun. I really don't know what these terms mean. Everybody interprets them differently and it makes it very hard to make sound decisions if, if at least the person asking the question isn't really sure about the shade conditions they have, which is often the case. So I have one very simple objective tonight, and that is to encourage people to become more observant about the quality of shade they have, to be looking and thinking about it so that they have a better idea of really the shade conditions they have and they will be able to make better choices. So what I'm suggesting here is super simple. It doesn't require a lot of, of knowledge. It's maybe common sense, but, but in fairness, uh, until you spend the time to think about these things, uh, it, it isn't necessarily something people instinctively do. So obviously the the first question I ask is what's creating the shade? Is it trees, small trees, large trees? What species of trees? That's always my question. Buildings, topography, other objects. And then I'm always asking people to, to visualize or understand the seasonal changes in light. When you take these two things, what's creating the shade and the seasonal changes, you get to the duration of light and, and really the, 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 the connection between quality and quantity of light, and that will help you make good decisions on what plants to choose for those particular locations. Now, I just put this graphic in. We know that the sun is highest in the sky at the uh, solstice and lowest in the summer solstice, lowest in the winter solstice, but all we really care about is really from about about April 15th-ish to maybe the vernal equinox. And understand that not only is the sun highest at the, at the solstice, it also comes up and goes down far to the east and to the west. And this all changes the light play in whatever situation you're looking at. So the kinds of things we are dealing with are walls and houses and uh, could be shrubs, it could be a flowering tree in this example. And understanding what side, what time of day, how much, how much ambient light is coming through, direct light is very, very important. Spending some time thinking about it and observing it, not just on any given day or at the same time every morning, but looking at it more, more thoroughly. Uh, 
many of you have situations, we all have situations. If you own a house and you're landscaping it, the north side, and people say, hey, the north side's so shady. Well, the north side of your house may be shady. You may live in a two-story house, which, which uh, exacerbates the issue. But a normal ranch-style house during the solstice, okay, and summer solstice, actually does not cast that uh, long a shadow. This particular photograph was taken around the solstice. Uh, uh, this is a view of a, this is actually the first, the first landscape I did about 30 years ago and uh, taken about 28 years ago after we, we installed it. But um, we know that this is early in the morning and we know that we are, we are looking west because of the shadows and the trees. This north side of the house is bathed in light. Now, as the season progresses into June, July, August, the shadow will extend away from the house a little bit. Only the, really the first 10 feet of a, of a ranch home along the north side is gonna be in dense shade. The rest of it is gonna get light at some point in the day, some significant light, unless there is other obstacles, trees and, and, and other buildings. In other buildings, um, this is an example. This is a, 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 a beautiful architecturally designed home. And uh, we did a retrofit. Um, I promise you, we did not plant the Japanese maple. Not that there's anything wrong with Japanese maples or mugu pines or all the other things that we encountered on this project, but we were tasked with dealing with this, this um, intractable little space that architects just gloat over uh, how cool this is as you enter the house, cozy little entry. Um, it's very difficult to landscape these spaces. Not only is it light limited and you can see how difficult, how many challenges there are, this is, in all kinds of light shadow, it's also in rain shadow. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Observing the play of light around your home. This is a project before we actually planted it, uh, where we studied the movement of light over the course of the day and over the course of the season. This was a very, very difficult project for a number of reasons. Uh, one is uh, it was very dry. It was very compacted and it was very, very shady. And the shade is, is, is a, the result mostly of the surrounding uh, undisturbed uh, woodland that, that uh, comes with the house, it surrounds the house. Natural systems are very different. We don't have large rectangular objects setting in, setting, setting in places like this. These are systems by which there are generally high canopies. And if you were to look at this with light, uh, with a time-lapse photography, you would see that these cones of light would be dancing around and there would be direct light in most parts of this particular setting. There's a mosaic of plants here. And those, that mosaic of plants is dictated largely, not exclusively, by the play of light. Places that get more shade are going, to are going to favor or disfavor certain species. This is not exactly what is going on in your yard because large vertical objects cast a very different kind of shade. And you want to be thinking about that and appreciating that. And of course, in natural systems, we have things like wind throw and fire and beavers and things opening the canopy up periodically. And when you go for a walk in your local park or preserve in, in these woodland systems, you can often just see the sun, you can see the play of light by the vegetation, even on a cloudy day where certain types of, of plants reside will indicate openings in the canopy where where light is penetrating or where light penetrated historically. Uh, this slide uh, I put in to just introduce this idea that many people come to the nursery and they want to 
plant trillium and and trout lily and all these beloved uh, ephemeral plants that we are soon going to be seeing in a few weeks. Um, these are shade plants, right? And I always say these are not shade plants. These plants are are renting the Cancun timeshare at a certain time of year. These plants are, have high light requirements, okay? They're using the space largely during the time as things warm up before the dis dis deciduous trees above them obstruct the light. If you plant these plants in, in dark places, let's say right up on the north side of a house or in a place it does not get any spring light, they will eventually fade away. They need a certain amount of light every spring, intense light that allow them to build up enough energy stores so that they can, can survive until the next spring when they can recharge their, their battery, so to speak. This slide uh, I put in deliberately to kind of juxtapose two kinds of plants and the term ephemeral um, is not really a technical term and we use it each loosely and it can be interpreted interpreted slightly different. Some people would consider both these ephemeral plants and I wouldn't disagree exactly. They have very ephemeral uh, flowers. They bloom for short periods of time and the, the flowers fade. But the trout lily on one hand is the vegetation itself is ephemeral and by July, you will not find this plant visually in the, in the woodlands in which they reside because they are then dormant. Where in a typical year, the blood root will persist all the way till fall. It's photosynthesizing the entire season, which sets up this, this loose dichotomy between these clearly ephemeral plants and these plants that don't really fit that category, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. A, a classic ephemeral plant is Dutchman's Bridges. I, I think by, by the end of June, you cannot find vestiges of even the senescing foliage. By July, for sure not. It's, it's classic, a classic ephemeral. I'll get back to that and talk a little bit more about that in a minute. I wanna, I wanna mention, um, and I often do, uh, particularly to people that come out to the nursery, the difference between what I consider horticultural tolerances and ecological tolerances. There are a ton of plants in our native flora that can do things in your landscape that you don't think they can do because you don't see them in the environment in that context. This is, this is a great thing. <clears throat> in this case, I have on the left, uh, bladder nut, used uh, de very deliberately in this residential landscape in this miserable little narrow strip between two properties where some privacy was necessary. It's, it was a good choice for this space because any stems that get in the way can easily be cut and the plant itself, the stems itself have a very, has a very vertical nature. But this light situation in this setting is unlike any light play that you'd find in its native environment. It gets direct sun for two hours and then it's in shade the rest of the day because it's between two houses and there's some big trees in front of it. So it has a very unusual light uh, shade uh, dynamic going on. In the, in the native environment in which it grows, it's getting dappled light all day, okay? It's not growing in the densest of shade um, and it's getting light from, dapples of light from morning till evening typically. There are many examples of things that you can use in your landscape that you wouldn't think could tolerate your conditions because it's, it's a little, uh, I don't know if I want to say dangerous, but you can really mislead yourself by assuming that just because you saw it in, the, in a particular context in a walk you took, that it's, it's where you're going to want to put it in your yard. And I, I've been using this sl slide or this saying for almost 30 years, and that is plants don't 
uh, don't grow where they like, they grow where they can. Let me see if I can get rid of this. Thank you. Okay. And what I'm saying about this is that we like to say, oh, plants, this plant likes this, or this plant doesn't like this, or this loves these conditions. Plants don't have these emotions. I, as much as I anthropomorphize many, many things about my own landscape, we have to sort of get this out of our mind for a moment and understand that plants are opportunists. They grow where they are most competitive. And if in your yard, you are changing the dynamic, the competitive dynamic. So there's a lot of things you can grow in your yard that you would never think you could grow there because you are making the rules and you are, you're sort of going around the, the rules mother nature has set up in natural ecosystems like this. Oops, what's going on here? Um, okay, well, here's an example. Um, here's a whole mix of plants that would not necessarily coexist in any one place for a variety of reasons. You might say, well, you, you might see bone set and Joe Pieweed together and you, you would, but this is a, actually a, a, a fairly shaded site. Um, there's a building to the right and some big trees that are with very high canopies that cast a lot of dappled light here. So it's just an example of uh, what I'm getting at. Um, I was at a talk at the Stewardship Network. Some of you may have been there. Maybe, maybe you've heard Mike Cost. And perhaps Mike has spoke to this chapter uh, previously. Uh, great guy, he works at MathEye. He's an author, uh, great ecologist, super, super good guy. Uh, he gave this talk and he, he introduced this idea that was uh, first developed by a, a forest ecologist by the name of Curtis at the University of Wisconsin. And I'm going to introduce this idea. Don't, don't seize too closely on the numbers. I had a long conversation with Mike earlier today about this, this graph. And uh, by the way, he's giving a talk tonight at the Oakland Wild Ones. Anyway, um, what Curtis did is he set up this adaption systems, adaption number system. And I'm gonna briefly and briefly describe what he was getting at. If you can see my cursor, um, the, uh, the, this, is, this particular graph is, is based upon sugar maple and all the, the ability of other species to regenerate beneath it. So uh, 10 is the, the best you can do, okay? And this is on a relative scale. Um, this isn't any kind of unit or, or of any kind. So sugar maple regenerates fabulously under sugar maple, where on the other hand, burr oak, Quercus macrocarpa, does not regenerate very readily under sugar maple. Uh, you'll see basswood, tilia right here, uh, germinates and reestablishes readily under sugar maple. What Curtis was getting at is a whole host of things that, that create this situation, of which light is one of them. In his, in his adaption system, um, he factored in moisture, nutrients, and light, but light plays a critical role in this. And I want to seize this and, and, and to tell you that the light cast by different species of trees has a huge effect on what you can grow under them. Many of you know that Norway maple is one of the most in frustrating, intractably difficult species to, to landscape under. Sugar maple has big leaves and casts some of the densest shade of any native species. And then Norway maple is even more extreme. It leafs out earlier. It holds its leaves longer. It has more leaves per unit area. Its branching system uh, creates very, very dense shade. So if you come to the nursery and you say, well, I have this tree that I wanna, I wanna landscape under, 
I, the first thing I'm gonna ask you is what's, what type of tree is it? And to that end, I, someone will probably ask this question, what do you do with the Norway maple? Well, short of cutting it down, which is often not practical, I suggest contacting an arborist and open up the canopy. Get some light and ability of moisture to, to, to move through the canopy. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that right now, is the correlation between shade and moisture. They're, they're intrinsically connected because uh, what is obstructing light is also obstructing water. The canopy of a tree can hold thousands of gallons of water before that water accumulates to a degree where it drips down. So if you don't get an appreciable amount of precipitation, that, that rain, which might benefit an open area, is providing no moisture to the area below the tree. You can compensate for shade with moisture. That is not a recommendation to irrigate those areas. It's a recommendation to choose species, not just on the amount of light, but on the amount of moisture. And this is one of the problems with Norway maple. To the same, to a similar degree, it's sugar maple too. They have dense canopies, they're bone dry. Often people have irrigation that exacerbates this problem. There's superficial roots that you can't get a plant established in because the roots are right up at the surface. Um, so opening the canopy and letting more through fall, more rain penetrate the canopy is gonna help the situation. I put the maidenhair fern there because maidenhair fern uh, look how dense that foliage is. It has a lot of surface area, which is typical of shade tolerant species, but it does not grow in dry areas. So it has to have naturally occurring moisture in order for it to thrive. It doesn't have to be wet. It shouldn't be wet, but it can't be bone dry. Now, this I'm bringing together a whole bunch of things I've just spoke about, this difference between horticulture and ecological tolerance and moisture and light. Um, I think everybody listening is familiar with spice bush. It's one of the most beloved native shrubs in our flora. Um, and where you find it naturally, typically is in moist, mesic to moist wetlands, uh, mesic to moist forests and, and, uh, and certain types of, of wetland systems. They're generally, they're generally shaded to some degree. But for those people who are experienced and have walked around quite a bit, you will find plenty of natural systems where this plant grows in the open. And these are places that have natural seeps where the moisture is there all the time. It never dries out. So this is a, an example where moisture can, can oh, in the other direction, uh, can you can plant something that is typically tolerant of shade in a more open environment if it has moisture and vice versa, uh, like the maidenhair fern. Now, the reverse example, may, maybe more applicable to this conversation, is species that typically grow in the open that you can grow in the shade. Um, species like red twig dogwood, silky dogwood, uh, and uh, these particular species can be planted in shaded environments. They're not gonna flower profusely. They're not gonna fruit very well, but they will look great. They'll be green, lush, um, fulfill a need in some difficult situations. We, these are go-to species for us in certain applications. I, I wanna say here, and I should have maybe prefaced this, is that the majority of our native shrubs require open areas, they require light. There's a subset, a small subset of shrubs that grow in wood, woodland environments and a small set that grow in savanna. But most of them like silky dogwood, red twig dogwood are species that, that typically grow in the open. Those two in particular do well in the shade. The mighty oak, um, this is just an example of how different this species is compared to a Norway maple. 
the openness of the branching, the the, the leaf, uh, the leaf, each leaf is smaller. They're um, they're toothed. They're, they have these these margins. Uh, they don't have as many leaves on them. Um, and you can see how much light penetrates the canopy. I encourage you, if you have a light meter, like they used to use in the old days, for photography, to go walk around with it and, and, and use it under various types of trees. And if you do that enough, and this has been done and been published, you will find that there is this, this gradation between different species of the amount of light that penetrates the canopy. So this talk is all about conversations I have with customers and everybody's really geeked about pen sedge, pen sedge this, pen sedge the answer to my lawn. It's, it's, it's a panacea. Well, it's not. Um, pen sedge is not a particularly shade tolerant species. It tolerates some shade, but there is a threshold on on, on, at which it will not continue to thrive. And you and I'm going to give you some keys to sort of look at this in the environment. So pen sedge is a classic savanna species. You will find it in, in Ma maple beech woods, but you will only find it in gaps. And those those populations that you find in these, these places may be vestiges of a woodland that existed there prior to the oaks and beaches that grow there today. Most of the, the forested areas that we encounter in our daily life, parks and preserves, have been cut and regrown and cut. So what it was pre-settlement is sometimes hard to, to determine at a glance. And these areas of Penn Sedge probably were part of a fire adapted oak woodland. I'm not saying 100%, but generally. Penn Sedge requires lots of light. It can, it can exist in, in, in full sun, and it does in certain parts of its range and in certain localities. But it likes these areas around oaks in particular that burn. Fire is a... Uh, is a friend of Penn Sedge. It, it actually is a great fuel. Um, and it, it likes these areas that get dappled light and a lot of light with a little bit of shade. Other species that we think of as woodland plants are really savanna plants. If you observe, if, as you go walking and you observe plants like true Solomon seal, Columbine, geranium, false Solomon seal, doll's eyes, red and white. You will generally find them along the edges. These are plants that had to find a new niche when we destroyed the savanna. These plants require a lot of light. Uh, none of these plants I just mentioned are ephemeral. They grow all year, they require light all year. And they have found a place to thrive along roads and paths and cleared areas on the edges of woodlands. And if you do find them in interior, they're probably in large light gaps that have been there, uh, open parts of the canopy that have been there a long time. Not that they're not useful for planting in your yard in shaded areas, but they're not gonna tolerate the densest shade you have. So what you may wanna know is, okay, you're talking about this quality of shade and, and all these shade plants I thought I could use um, are not tolerant, as tolerant as I need, and, and now you're telling me the site's too dry. So what are the species that tolerate the greatest amount of shade in the driest conditions. And um, I'm not the guy who is gonna give you a generic list. Uh, I much rather you try to spend some time observing your environment, do some reading, come to the nursery, come go to another native plant nursery, ask our advice, 
of people who, who grow these plants and and try to figure it out. But I'm going to I'm going to give you a few go to plants that we use for the driest, shadiest environments. Species like blue stem goldenrod, heart leaf aster, um, uh, big leaf aster, uh, bush honeysuckle, bottle brush grass, um, and there are more. But these are we use these commonly in in really really dry, shaded environments. Bush honeysuckle is a great plant for these really, really difficult places. It can tolerate and grows naturally in dry, shaded environments. This plant will grow great in full sun with ample water. I warn you, it'll go crazy. It uh, is very opportunistic in the, that environment. You have changed the rules. You've given it great, great opportunity in those environments in your garden. I've made this mistake myself, um, where it will it will grow much better than everything around it. But in really dry, shaded environments, it's really limited, and there isn't much that will compete with it. Or, and so you're not going to be letting it outcompete anything you really don't want it to. This is actually a shrub, by the way, not a perennial plant. It's a low-growing shrub. The beloved plantain sedge. Um, I am going to regret showing this because people will come to the nursery this spring and ask for it, and we may be sold out. We we struggle to produce enough of this. This is a beautiful woodland sedge. It is doing its thing early. It will actually flower and produce seed by the I think generally by the first week of May. It's already produ produced its seed. Um, uh, we're, we're working on producing more of this. This is a great plant and, uh, and complements many, many uh, woodland gardens with great texture and can tolerate dense shade, but not, den uh, not extremely dry conditions. Ginger can tolerate very shaded conditions, but again, it can't tolerate extreme dry conditions. This is another one I'm going to regret uh, showing. Uh, this happens to be one of my very favorite plants. People always ask me what's my favorite plant. I don't have a favorite plant, but this would be right up there. It's Durka palustris, the leatherwood. It's it's geeky, and I know that there, whoever's listening to me tonight has to be geeky. Um, this is an easy plant to grow in your garden, but it's a little hard to cultivate at the nursery scale. So we're always we're always a little bit behind the eight ball in producing enough of this species. Um, but it's wonderful. It blooms early in the spring. It is one of the very few woodland shrubs. And it has this very has many weird characteristics. One is it is always a single stem shrub. It has a little mini trunk. It never is never suckers ever. It's really distinctive once you you tune your eyes into this characteristic. And it's called leatherwood because the stems are so flexible, you can actually tie them in a knot and it won't, they won't break. It produces yellow flowers very, very early. It's a, a wonderful little shrub. And uh, I'm gonna end here by just uh, showing again, uh, bladder nut, I, I like to use this this plant is an example of a terrible common name for a very beautiful plant. Um, we should call this Michigan lantern plant or something, but uh, bladder nut is just uh, not nearly flattering enough for how wonderful this, this, uh, this shrub is. Uh, this also can tolerate dense shade as long as it isn't bone dry. And uh, I think that's my last slide with uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions, which is by far the most interesting part of the talk. Do I unshare here? Let's see. Hmm. Thank Carolyn, you. are you there? Yep, I am here. Help me. 
I know I'm gonna <laughs> I'm trying I this is what I'm doing <laughs> so uh go ahead and go back to that share screen and stop sharing oh actually like hang on I think I got it there you go <laughs> Oh, thank you, Bill. You've given me some ideas, which is wonderful. <laughs> so we have a few questions. Uh, to, okay. Do you want to field them or do you want me yep. to? Nope. I can do I can answer I can ask them for you. Um, That'd be great. Are there certain trees that have thinner canopies and will allow more moisture to reach the ground beneath? For sure, and I would um, I would go right. The first species I would look towards would be oaks. Um, the amount of light that penetrates them is more, and more light means more rain will fall through the canopy. And I think you're going to observe this that even in your yard, if you have oaks, they're just much easier to landscape under. So that's not the, not in it in an exclusive list. Uh, tulip poplar is a great one, it has big leaves, a little bit more closed canopy, but it tends to be, the canopy tends to be very high, even on a young tree. So uh, it has generally, unless it's a very old tree, has generally a relatively narrow crown, so it allows more light and water underneath it. I would concur. <laughs> uh, next question. What about silver maple, which has a lot of shallow roots? Ours does has ours does have a more open canopy. It's very dry out to the drip line. So uh, the issue with with silver maple is really moisture. It's mm -hmm. a it's a moisture hog, and it's looking for moisture wherever it can get it. It's adapted to it's a floodplain tree and floodplains tend to, to support or the trees that colonize those environments tend to be shallow rooted because deep rooted plants encounter anaerobic conditions. And it, it's a good, good thing to just mention. And I think most of you know this, that the majority of our, of our street trees historically Things have changed in the last 20 years, but historically have all been floodplain species because along our streets, the soils are really compacted and anaerobic. And thick plants like maple and honey locust, um, and silver maple are all plants that are also, because of this ability to adapt to low oxygen, have made historically good street trees. So the, the, the challenge with with silver maple is that it it has a pretty open canopy. The leaves are relatively, re relative to sugar maple, smaller. It's allowing a lot more through fall of precipitation, but it is a wick for water. <laughs> and that's gonna be a, a challenge. I think what people do and do successfully is without burying the trunk, you don't wanna pile mulch up onto the trunk, but uh, if you can put, mulch or even a thin layer of topsoil over these superficial roots, you can sometimes begin to get some things that will establish. And once they root in, those roots will find a way. Just getting them started is the challenge. All right. Are there any guides readily available that you had talked about in reference to understand common shrubs or flowers that would grow beneath a particular tree species? I don't, I don't have a particular reference you can, can um, refer to that distills this down, boils it down. Um, there is the Height Shoot book. Carolyn, are you familiar with the Height Shoot? No. The name of the author. Oh. Uh, Gary Height Shoot, I think is his name. Uh, it's a great book and it talks about not just shrubs, but trees. It gives you a ton of interesting information. Um, I can step away from my desk and show you the book um, if you like, or I can just send, uh, maybe better to just send an email of the name of the book. This is a, um, uh, you know, the challenge with, with books 
is that we expect to find definitive answers. And they are good, great guides. And whoever asked the question, I think used the word guide. And I think that's the operative word here. Um, and I use this book uh, for a lot of, of reasons. It tells you tolerance to contamination and air pollution and its sensitivity to nightlight. It's, it's a fantastic book. But in the end, you gotta, you gotta walk the last mile yourself. And uh, plants vary across their ranges and every site is different. I work mostly in lower Michigan and um, Ottawa County is very different than Jackson County, different than Monroe. And two sites in Monroe can be very, very different from one another. So I think that that would get you, uh, that, that one book would be very helpful. And um, books that are not helpful for landscaping, and I am not, uh, by no means am I discrediting the value of Michigan Flora, the U of M publication with Tony and uh, Tony Resincheck, um, is that it's not it's not a horticulture book. It's a botanical reference. <laughs> and uh, it if you rely on the descriptions there, it will tell you where you're gonna find these plants in nature, but it's not gonna tell you where you can establish them in your yard. And among the, the resources you should rely on are native plant producers like myself and the others, several now in the Lansing area, and I think a total of maybe 40 around the state, can give you some really good guidance. And everybody's going to give you a little bit different take, and collectively, you'll get a better idea of what's going to work. Here's a good one. <laughs> what are some good mild shade plants under black walnut? <laughs> ah, good one. Um, Boy, I should have been prepared for this question. I am. Um, I have a black walnut, and I, I informally test a bunch of stuff. Um, we find that nodding onion uh, works works pretty well. Triostium. I don't know if you know that. You know that plant, Carolyn, but it's a it's a freaky, geeky kind of plant. Um, horse gentian. It's called. Okay. Yes. Yep. Um, we find that that uh, tolerates walnut pretty well. Hookera tolerates it. Things that for sure don't, let me just mention that, um, and these are well-known, anything member of the Rosaceae. So strawberry potentilla, not going to work a <laughs> second, okay? Um, of course, anything solanaceous, which we don't have a lot of ornamental native solanaceous plants. Um, uh, those are the ones that, oh, Mertensia does really well under walnut. Uh, a great one, a true ephemeral. Um, I have to think about it a little bit more, but those are, the, that, that begins the, the conversation. One thing I will say about walnut uh, that's, that's really important to know is that, uh, again, I'm not a list guy. I'm gonna make a list of the things that you can grow under walnut. I'm all, I always look at these lists. I believe them until I try them. And then I learn that they have to be interpreted. And with walnut, the soils they're growing on has a lot to do with the tolerance of plants that, that grow beneath them. If you're on heavy soils and you have, then the soils have high cation capacity, they hold the jugulins, the, the, the allelopathic compound tightly and it doesn't leach away and it accumulates the only the most tolerant plants can can tolerate that. If you're on sandier soils and the 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 environment is moister and that those compounds leach readily, you will find that you will be able to get away with a broader group of species. Uh, another question. I'm new to this. I'm new to so much of this. Is it totally acceptable to call the nursery or any nursery to ask questions about plants? Um, <laughs> well, I'm only going to speak for my nursery. <laughs> Come to a sale day. Yep. And we have lots of people that are ready to help you. We have a hard time answering questions on the phone. We have lots of questions for you before we can answer your questions. And we have the t we make the time on these retail days, and I'm, this is not a sales pitch. 
come to, and I think this is, I don't want to speak for other nurseries, but I think this is probably true of them as well. Come to our nursery. I'm not expecting you to buy anything. Come and learn something. We don't want you to make a mistake and, um, and we'll, we'll help you even if it doesn't result in you leaving with plants. That's even, it's often the best, the best thing is. I would, I will, I will agree with that. Go to a plant, go to his plant sales people. <laughs> and, and, and other nurseries too. Exactly. They're ready. They're, they're allocating that time to talk to you. Yes. Uh, I have another one, another person. I love ferns. I have dense shade with irrigation. What ferns do you recommend? Well, I would start with the easy ones. And um, things like lady fern. Um, lady fern is an easy one. Uh, if you have a lot of moisture, sensitive fern, but that takes a little bit of light, a little bit more light, grows in shade but not dense shade. Maidenhair fern is actually quite easy. And is there a more elegant mm -hmm. plant around? So I would start with the easy, easy low hanging fruit. Um, plants like um, uh, cinnamon fern and, and, um, and uh, interrupted fern, the, uh, th that, that group, that genera, tend to be very site specific. They tend to like acidic conditions, well-drained well soils. And our, dem our demographic of where people have settled in Michigan is disproportionately po populated in places with heavier alkaline soils. Uh, it's not typical of the entire state, but that's where people live. Detroit area is dominated by heavier soils. And not that there isn't pockets of acidic soils, but most of them are alkaline. Those kinds of ferns, erupted cinnamon fern, uh, several others are not going to work in those environments. Here's another one. <clears throat> I have bishop's weed growing aggressively in shade area. Is there a native plant that would outcompete it? So um, uh, people ask this question like we're picking sides in a boxing match, you know. <laughs> If, if you match Frazier with Ali, who's going to win that boxing match? Um, the, the, um, I, think in this, I think in this case, I think it's a, a valid question. And I think anything that, that will, will also grow in that area will give that weed a run for its money. So um, uh, I can't tell because I don't know your I don't know your light conditions I don't know your soil conditions I don't know where in the state you live it'd be hard for me to recommend a specific plant but anything that will grow in that area will that's not a, a terribly competitive plant it can be out competed uh, it's just it's responding to the conditions that have been created there and that's what I call opportunism not not invasiveness plants, taking advantage of the set of circumstances, the disturbance, whatever it is, and a particular thing just goes crazy. What would you recommend to put in a pocket forest as a ground cover that doesn't go crazy? Um, uh, when you say a pocket forest, you're talking about a... Uh, it, Ask them what they mean by a pocket forest. One of these Japanese um, uh, Miyataki. Uh, I think it's just a small, not so much a you know a big forest, but rather, um, and I've seen this being tossed around a little bit. Uh, just small air, a small planting of you know trees, creating just sort of that miniature forest. So I would I would suggest planting something that does go crazy. Yeah. Um, you want something that's gonna be very opportunistic. And um, and what we do a lot, and you can sort of see it in, in the background of the slide, um, is if you look carefully, we mix ground covers and we try to blend them in ways, knowing that one or two are probably going to dominate over time. But a common mix for us is mixing strawberry with potilla 
It's kind of like strawberry rhubarb pie. This is strawberry potentilla ground cover. And we, we often add, I wouldn't do this in a pocket for us, but we often add um, uh, Virginia creeper. Uh, maybe not the right thing in that application. If it's moist, we use, we add Canada anemone. We might use um, 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 uh, ranunculus, um, oh gee, I'm blanking. Um, uh, like a buttercup? Yeah, swamp buttercup. Yeah, yes. Uh, we might use swamp buttercup. We might use on the edges, uh, allium or when it's young. Realize that as this thing grows and it will grow quickly, the, the light dynamic is going to change. The conditions are going to change and something else is going to have to, you, you start out with X and you end up five or 10 or 15 down, years down the road and there's going to have to be something else. These pocket forests, the ones I'm familiar with, um, are so dense that very little is going to grow beneath them. Now, there is some light that we'll get in from the sides because some of them are, depends on how, how large they are. Some of them are as, as small as 10 or 15 feet in, in diameter. Wow. Some of them are, are 40, 80 feet in diameter or bigger. So the, you're certainly going to be able to grow a greater variety or the diversity will be greatest around the perimeter where there's light. Um, let's see. I have a small stand of red and white pines. So the ground is covered year round with pine needles and it also happens to be near full shade. Are there any shade plants that grow well under pines in this situation? So I, I, uh, I heard a couple of talks at, um, the stewardship network that kind of uh, opened my my mind to, and I've touched upon them. I've, in, I've kind of included some of that in into this talk, and that um, I used to say, and I still believe, a pine plantation, which is not necessarily your yard, but a pine plantation, uh, the 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 boughs, the, the 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 trees are planted very densely. The boughs are pretty low, and the dent the shade is so dense and it's so dry. Look what grows underneath there nothing. There'll be some uh, rubus species, some brambles, and a few other things that can tolerate and, and find a little bit of light here and there, but virtually nothing. Now, uh, what we like to do in our yards is we like to grow conifers in the most aesthetically pleasing way. We don't like to, uh, in, unless they're really big trees, huge trees, we don't like to limb them up. I don't like to limb them up. I like white pines that have a, a grace and I like low hanging boughs. In that situation, it's almost impossible to get anything to grow. The go-to plant I would start with would be bush honeysuckle. If there's anything that's gonna grow there, it's probably gonna be bush honeysuckle. And the other one I might try would be the big leaf aster. And again, I don't know where this person lives. Um, if they are on sandier soils in a different part of the state, I might change that a little bit. But um, regardless of where they live in the state, I the first thing I would try would be bush honeysuckle. This is one of the most difficult kinds of environments to landscape, not just because it's full sun, I'm sorry, full shade all the time, but it's really dry. Uh, just a couple more here. Uh, somebody wondered you had said strawberry potentilla. Is that a particular species or is it strawberry? Oh. And a potentilla. <laughs> so it's it's our wild strawberry, Fragaria virginiana, and our one of our native, we have a number of them, but one of our native potentillas called potentilla simplex, old field potent. Uh, old field cinquefoil is what the yes. common is. Yeah. Um, so those are two different species. They grow prostrate. They they um, they their fruits don't look very similar. They flower roughly about the same time. They the the strawberry has white flowers. The potentilla has yellow flowers. Mm -hmm. 
generally don't bloom exactly at the same time, but they intermingle and from a distance, they have a, a homogenous look, which I think is a plus because aesthetically, we haven't talked about aesthetics, but aesthetically uh, we are trying to match and complement textures, openness contrasted with density, and that uniformity that it provides is a very aesthetically unifying element. And one question, we're gonna let you go get the book, but people are wondering okay. to see the book. So sure. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's gonna be backwards. Nope, I don't think it is. Nope, oh. it's perfect. Can you see it? It's like it's really flashy to me. Yeah, it's doing the same thing. I think because do you want to read it to me? So yeah, and yeah, it's called Native Trees, Shrubs, and Vines of Urban and Rural America. Oh. And it's written by Gary L. Height shoe. How do you spell it's his a, last name? Uh, it's H I G H T S H O E. Okay, there we go. And it's a big, big book. <laughs> By the pound, you'll get your money's worth. <laughs> but I'm going to see, I'd like to show people. Uh, uh, I don't know if this is going to work. Um, Can you see that? No, it just, it just goes to your screen, your background screen. <laughs> Sorry, um, it, it's it has a very it's a reference book. This isn't something you read cover to cover. Um, it's it it highlights a bunch of shrubs and trees, and it gives you their average height and when they come to maturity, when it flowers, its sensitivity to light. It's a very very good book, and uh, I have used it for years. Um, that's a, that's one really, really good resource. Um, you know, the Durr manual, which is mm -hmm. many of, you know, in at almost any nursery, they have it on the counter. Um, it has a lot of native species in it too. And it gives you some good information there. Um, you know, I, I think many of the people who are listening have the same experience is that we all have these questions and we think that they're really common questions and they generally are, but it's hard to find the book that has the answer to that particular question you have. Um, so that's why I have behind me a huge library of books. And you know, why do I need another book? Well, it has three, three answers to questions I've had that are not answered in the other books. And um, that's why you need a big library. All right, I think. And bush honeysuckle, it's Divarilla. Dervilla. Dervilla. And let me just mention, because this is a weird uh, dynamic because I don't, I can't see who's who's part of the, the uh, listening group. Uh, so I'm just talking to a screen. To <laughs> some people, they're going to go, oh my God, he's suggesting planting honeysuckle. Yeah, what that's what the question kind of was. <laughs> What's with this guy? Um, so this is not, uh, common names are are not very good. Uh, this is not, we have native honeysuckles in the genus Lanisera, but there's a whole group of Eurasian species. There's a complex of them that are really problematic and uh, are wreaking havoc in every open space, natural area in the state. But this isn't, even part of that genus. And it's in a completely different genus and it just has this common name that includes honeysuckle. And that's why you should all know the scientific names, uh, especially our native plants would be a really good place to start. Um, and I'm to the point now where I, I don't even remember common names anymore. I just I've been doing this long enough and studying it long enough. It's just the scientific names for me now. <laughs> I don't remember the common names either because they're not very instructive and Correct. they 
uh, people co contact us and they say, well, I want Joe Pye weed. And of course I'll say, well, which one? Which one? <laughs> so um, I, I just mentioned this, the common name, scientific name. I was so gratified uh, last, I think it was last week, um, I gave a seed germination workshop to the uh, Oakland wild ones. And, um, and I gave them the whole thing about why common names are easy to use, but when you write this on the tag, write the scientific name mm -hmm. and everybody did i was it really really impressed and it just once you start using them they become they stick yeah it stinks well that is it for our questions um thank you so much bill it's good to see you in february though it feels like spring it's we're not yes. there yet <laughs> so but i think we're getting pretty happy to get through this winter and the doldrums and <laughs> the cloudy, you know, the cloudy days and look, looking forward to spring. So, and, and plant sales. So <laughs> it's, it's spring here. We, we started the greenhouse this week and we already have things germinating. So wow. I, in my mind it's spring. Yeah, I'm ready. I'm, I'm so ready. Of course I'm seeing ficaria already starting to pop up and, uh, I'm a little disappointed, <laughs> but thank you so very, very much. And um, thank you for the invitation. You're absolutely welcome. And everybody, thank you for joining. Um, you drew a great crowd and I think you'll draw a great crowd wherever you speak, Bill. So, <laughs> thank and you. thank you very much. And thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Thank you, everybody. All right. Good Have a good evening. And hope to see everybody soon. <laughs>